welcome to the Skiffy and Fanti Show's Mining the Genre Astra, a brand new live show reanimation of Paul's... Wait, is this about your soul, Paul? Yes, it is. <laughs> Did you reanimate your soul again? Yeah. Wow. It, was, it was getting a little dusty. Oh, got it. <laughs> oh, no, what, what's actually written here is long-running feature for our blog, a feature where older, overlooked genre gems are dug up and discussed anew. Interesting, Paul. What we're talking about today, we're talking about a book called The Demon Breed. Come from the action adventure on an ocean planet, stay for the intelligent otters. But it doesn't take place in Nepal or Tibet. <laughs> Are you sure? Positive. <laughs> You're up, Sean. Oh, is that is that me in the script again? Okay. Yes. Yep. Sorry. Where it says I'm Sean, that's you, Sean. Yeah, well, I'm not gonna look. say it. It might have screwed up again while I was talking about it, so I thought I would fix it. Anyway, <laughs> hi, I'm Sean. I'm the ineligible Paul. I'm Patricia, the poet. And, and didn't we technically already say what we're doing, Paul? Yes, we did. Well, we yes. Told. Yeah, so do I not actually do that? No, part say, say, say it I'll again. I'll do it again. I... I'll do this. Okay, do... got it. I'll do the script again. For those again coming in late. Because we're professionals. So on today's show, we'll Hugo, discuss 19... priorly nominated and eligible this year. Let's be real. This is becoming the Paul Weimer experience very soon. Uh, <laughs> so uh, on today's show, we'll discuss, again, the 1968 novel, or I should say story eventually serialized and then eventually turned into a novel, The Demon Breed by James H. Schmitz. So you can go read it now if you'd like to pause if you're listening at home. And if not, you're getting spoiled today. Too bad. Wait, actually, Sean, wait, wait, wait. Mining the genre asteroid, we're going to talk about the book in general terms so people can figure out how much it might interest them if they haven't ever read it, and they probably haven't. But then we're going to put up a spoiler wall, big wall, before we talk about specific details of the developments or surprises that would be mm, spoilery. So you can always come back later after you've read the book and join us for that part of the conversation. And, as always... Please share your comments with us about this and past episodes at skiffyandfanty.com slash listener suggestions. Some of these questions or comments might get discussed right here on future shows. If you aren't already, join us on Sean's Alphabet Streams Twitch channel to be a part of our interactive live streaming format. Ask your questions right then and there. Finally, be sure to join our Patreon. It only takes a dollar a month. And join us for our spe special speculative dispatch streams, a chance to get Skiffy and Fanty points for cool prizes and other perks. I like how you made that sound really fun. Thank you, Trish. <laughs> Trish is fun. Okay. Whoever wrote the script, I did not write this. So whoever wrote the script is making a few references because the next bit in our script says, okay, I'm going to have to have Un Chiquito Paulito give a quick summary of Demon Breed. So, so Paul... <laughs> I didn't write this, but I'm going to have to deal with this. Fine. <laughs> okay. The Demon Breed, set in James Smith's Federation of the Hub first, moves away from the telepathy and psi powers of tells the Ember, in which if you've read any James A. Smith, you probably know those books the most, and said shows us what one ordinary trained human can do facing an entire alien invasion of her planet. Do Dr. Niles Eklund would rather study the biology of a truly fascinating ocean-dominated world that she loves. But the aliens put the stop to that with their invasions game. So, a woman's gotta do what a woman's gotta do, and so the novel is Eklund opposed and bedeviled the alien invaders with the help of an old man looking for the secret of longevity and some intelligent otters. And some more mocks and panache than a tire suite of heroes. Action and adventure as Eklund slows and opposes the enemy long enough to a planetary response can be handle the secret invasion. Sound good? Sounds fine. So we should give some background about this, this book because I'm going to go out on a limb. A lot of people have never heard it of it before. Most people probably have never heard of Schmitz either. Uh, James A. Schmitz. And I'm sure other maybe Paul or Trish will talk a little bit about the author maybe afterwards. But I, a couple things we should note is uh, this book was originally uh, released serialized in analog. 
uh, under a different, uh, well, in a shorter form known as the Tavella, which is part of the, the novel. I'm sure we'll come back to it. Uh, it was published in paperback a little bit later and then obviously had reissues as part of like the sci-fi book club. Uh, and then there was apparently a bunch of translations of it. So it was reasonably popular in its era and then kind of disappeared for a while. And Bane has now released an omnibus of like all of the the hub, quote unquote, dangerous territory novels. Um, it is, I, I do find the Wikipedia note that it might be the first feminist science fiction book rather amusing because uh, it it probably is not <laughs> gonna, no i, I no, can say no. no i don't know no. who made that up and who wrote that on the wiki but i am deeply <sighs> amused by that um <laughs> this book is popular enough to have a wiki which is saying something but it is one of those wiki pages where it's basically four paragraphs of mostly general publication knowledge a completely unfounded paragraph about it being the the earliest instance of feminist SF, and then a <laughs> quote from Amazing Stories from 1969 when James Bush talked about how much he liked it, and that's kind of it. Uh, it's a little little bear, <laughs> to say the least, but it does do the thing I love, which is really bananas, silly dilly covers that look almost like art, kinda, but yet when you look close, you go, ah, uh, but is it? Is it? Yours is even more ridiculous oh. than mine. It, it gives us a very different impression. Because okay, yours I got looks... my copy handy. <laughs> so Trish's version for anyone who's watching at home, because it will be on YouTube later. Uh, it look if you w- looked at mine, you would go, okay, maybe 1960s sci-fi, right? There's probably some weird stuff in there. You look at Trish's and you go, oh, so it's it's Conan the Barbarian, right? Like <laughs> <laughs> there's like weird monkey people and and like she's wearing almost no clothing, and that's the way it is. Of course, there's a reason why she's in that clothing, because in the book, she goes diving and stuff. Like, so she's got appropriate gear for the divings. Also, I guess she looks like a Bond girl at the same time, as you do. So in any case, I, I guess the thing I would throw to Trish and and Paul, and, and you guys could fight over who would say this, is I do think we should talk about who Schmitz is, and then we should also talk about why this book. Well, I'll start since uh, Paul got to do the recap. Um, uh, uh, James H. Schmitz actually doesn't have a few huge amount of biographical information about himself that I was able to find uh, uh, on on my uh, well on my searches. Um, the uh, easily available information is that he was born in 1980, 1911 and died in nineteen eighty one. He was born in Germany of American parents. They left Germany during World War I, went back to Germany, and then fled back to the U.S. again before World War II. And he finally stayed put in, uh, <laughs> in the U.S. after that. His first published story was in 1943, a short story. And his last story, also a short story, was published in 1974. Um... Uh, other than the Tell of the Amber Dawn stories, he is probably best known for uh, his novel The Witches of Cares, or Cars, K-A-R-R-E-S, which was two years before this book, which was nominated for a Hugo Award. I find the plot of that almost incoherent. It's a space <laughs> opera with a male protagonist and female psionics witches. A lot of, uh, a lot of Schmitz's story do feature psionics. Uh, that was really big in the 60s or so, uh, you know, telepathy and other mental powers. Um, <clears throat> he was also, an earlier book was Agent of Vega, space opera, spy stuff, also with telepathy. Um, he had another normal human protagonist named Trigger Argy who was in some short stories in a book that was titled A Tale of Two Clocks, originally, later, Legacy. Um, a lot of his books were out of print, and stories were out of print for a long time, and then uh, Bain repackaged uh, some of them in a series of five books in the 2000s, I believe it was. Uh, but you can also just find the originals uh, by looking online and, you know, used bookstores and stuff like that. I uh, really enjoy Schmitz for his time. 
he was very progressive with regard to uh, female protagonists who were usually very competent and strong and smart um, uh, and fun to read about. Um, his, his, uh, some of his stories are also fairly thoughtful about um, uh, guarding yourself or guarding your environment against corporate exploitation. Um, I think uh, a lot of his books and stories have some interesting stuff, but this is probably my favorite. No, without a doubt it's my favorite, because Dr. Niall Etland, the protagonist uh, for most of the book, is uh, awesome and smart, and um, uh, the, the way the ecology is comes into effect in this book and how people have dealt with it and... Uh, do deal with it uh, and use it, uh, but also work with it, is a lot of fun. And there's some other stuff that is, um, well, you have to take or leave it with a grain of salt. <laughs> um, stuff about, uh, oh, the federal, the federation of the hub over government is rather laissez-faire and uh, purposely so in order to encourage the human species to be tough against its possible opponents. So, uh, I mean, some of that stuff is debatable, but just the main storyline is really interesting and smart, I think. Interesting. Paul, you want to add anything? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, so I came to Schmitz some years ago because a friend of mine, somewhat older, told me I should read Tilsley Embert. And I was like, okay. So I did that, and I read the Witches of Chorus. Um, I'm a little, I'm a little less critical than Trish, but it is kind of, kind of reminds me a bit like A.E. Van Vocht, where twists happen like eight every eight hundred uh, words or so, like clockwork. And so is the plotting. The plotting of that novel isn't so great, but I can understand why it was popular at the time. So I, 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 I had a decent background in Schmitz's work before Trish brought this book to my attention. This is one I had not actually read, and I was delighted that this one does deviate from the Schmitz formula, as Trish said, and not having psionics as its main focus, where you see that in so many of his other works and stories in The Hub. We do, we have an ordinary, ordinary, talented human getting it done, and that... And I fell in love. I might be not be uh, Daniel, Daniel of this podcast, but I have a, but long time <laughs> listeners of the show will remember I do have a degree, however unused, in biology. So the biology of the ocean planet fascinated me. the 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 islands, the islands of trees, the intelligent otters, the way that that Nile respects and uses the environment, and how it's brought to life within the novel really. Draw, drew me into this story and I, it may, I had not read Schmitz in a while it, it reminded me of why I liked him in the first place when I started reading the Telsey stories well could we talk about the world building since you yes. brought it up Paul so there are these these floating islands because the, the world we're on is not entirely a water world if I understand but is it's very mostly watery. ocean but you have these giant giant you have these giant Islands basically of giant mangrove cypress like trees that basically are basically form the mass of these islands that wander around the ocean. Um, what they were floating, yeah, on, floating on the currents, not they're floating, floating on, on the currents. currents. <laughs> yeah, and there's a cycle to them, and they have their own unique ecosystem as a consequence because they obviously move around with, with a very t with a very tiered ecosystem based on where you are within the uh where you are as far as the level within the actual island. The, the, the ecology, and Schmitz does a great job, and the, the ecology at water level is very different than the cloud, than, 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 than the cloud forest at the top. And it's a, very, it's a very tiered and complex web of relationships between creatures and plants of the, ver of, of the various levels of each individual island. Right. Parts of the story have Nile and her otters swimming through kelp forests under and around the island, and parts of it have her climbing around in the jungle canopy of the uh, of the uh, of the island. Um, and uh, you know, you, you progress. You have uh, 
giant birds, um, giant flightless birds uh, that, you know, usually uh, uh, eat ocean, eat large ocean fish and stuff. Um, uh, and you, you have um, uh, uh, lots and lots of different uh, plants, some of which are not nearly as... Uh, mm, Benign, as, Benign like. <laughs> as they might appear, right? Um, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, so Niall Etland is someone who grew up uh, hunting for for uh, things to take home and use with her parents, and so she's familiar with everything that is there. And then she studied it as a biologist uh, once she she. Uh, uh, grew up um and uh now works for a pharmacological company that harvests well that surveys all the the species and harvests them uh uh in a sustainable way um and uh another thing that's rather progressive <laughs> to some degree the idea that a pharmaceutical company might be interested in preservation <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, there are other har there are other Schmidt stories where um corporations are basically laying waste to whole redwood type forests and things like that. So, you know, he's not uh he's not unreservedly unreservedly go go corporations. He, you know, recognizes that things are complex. <laughs> I mean, I suppose to some degree, the future of this story wants to be just like, there needs to be a little optimism about the trajectory of our systems of power. Because <laughs> there's yeah, all I'd kinds say of it's very problems. optimistic. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we might want, we might want to start veering towards putting up that spoiler wall if we're going to go further deep. Into I, the, it's already book. up. It's fine. They already they got okay. their warning earlier. Thank if you don't okay. want to know what's going on in this book, leave now. <laughs> Get out. But what uh, I like about this book is. That we got a couple layers here. Yes, this at the base is the story of Dr. Niall Eklund versus aliens, but we also have this whole the whole subplot of Tico's K looking for immortality on this planet and looking through the biology of it as a as a project, and just like his project just gets wrapped up with the whole alien invasion. It, it's it's delightful that we got a couple different and of course then there's the aliens themselves who wind up getting convinced that Niall is some superhuman that that and the humans have this super cast. What this reminds me of, I'm not now I'm gonna already go into comps. Um <laughs> Sean, have you ever seen the the Doctor Who episode the Santaran experiment? The old Doctor Who fourth Doctor. No, I've never seen old Doctor Who. Okay. So for the listeners, fourth Doctor, you know Tom Baker, if you think of an old Doctor, you yeah, that's the one. Um, in the Santaran experiment, he winds up on a future devastated Earth. There's not a lot of people around because most people are asleep on a space station, but that's the last episode. And so a, a Santaran, you know, the guys with the plug in the back of the neck, shows up and the Santaran's looking for who basic, who, what kind of warriors the Earth has. Because he's convinced the Earth must have a warrior cast to defend them. And once the Doctor figures out that's what he's looking for, the Doctor says, I represent the warrior cast of Earth. And the Centauri just goes with that because he's clueless and doesn't realize he's a Time Lord. Do so these aliens are kind of convinced that Niall Eklund is the warrior cast of this of the humans, and just this and they, all their mistakes run from the fact that they're convinced that she's a superwoman, part of a secret clique, protecting and running humanity. It's delightful the the. Just the basic mistake and the consequences of the aliens not understanding it. No, she's she's a she's competent, she's intelligent, she's adaptive, but she's just an ordinary human in the end, and they just don't get that about humanity. Right. Well, also she had had the the groundwork laid for her by Doctor Tikas K, mm -hmm. uh, who was on the island and got captured by the uh, by the um, <clears throat> aliens at the beginning of the book. But uh, even before then, um, they had thought there must be some kind of secret super race controlling humanity because they had tried to invade the Federation before and been thrown back pretty easily. And since they are convinced that they are a perfect race and, you know, uh, 
there must have just been some fluke. And so they say, ah, we just didn't know enough going into this invasion. We, they, we didn't realize they had a secret super cast of immortal humans controlling the rest of humanity. Which, in the Federation of the Hub, there actually are telepaths and, and people, but it turns out that they're not necessary. Uh, <laughs> they're not, not necessary, necessary to defend the planet. <laughs> no, that, that's, that's the irony. That's the irony, Sean. In, in the actual universe, there are kind of super people running around Schmitz's hub verse, but they don't, take any, they don't have anything to do with stopping the aliens. They have, they're not there at all. It's, it's, it's the Niles, Tikos, and Otter show to uh, thwart the aliens. Yeah, to, to be fair, there are have been a lot of stories from the Golden and Silver Age on um, uh, about um, aliens trying to invade humanity and being surprised at how tough humans are. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the frequently given reasons is that, oh, uh, we, uh, you know, we, we looked at... Uh, images you know that reached us through light speed from a hundred years ago and they were only just developing radio then how can they possibly have <laughs> nuclear bombs and, and spaceships now uh, so that's a very common reason for old science fiction uh, uh stories for humanity to triumph um uh but uh let's see let me look at my notes. I, but there are there are you know numerous stories of human exceptionalism where, hey, humanity is great. It'll tr it'll triumph over all its uh, all its things. I mean, sometimes it's really something simple like H. G. Wells's microbes on Earth and germs that kill the aliens. But uh, uh, there's. There, Lots of stories where uh, humanity unexpectedly to the aliens uh, are, are beats are back invasion. Right. Um, um, in, in this era, Christopher Anvil's stories are about aliens that come and conquer Earth, conquer Earth and conquer humanity and then realize they've bitten off much more than they can chew because the, the humans adapt to their technologies and turn the tables in pretty fast order. There's also... Harry Turtle Dove's World War series, where al aliens send a probe to Earth in the 12th century, see knights, and figure, okay, we can invade in 800 years, it'll just be the same. So they invade during World War II, and are surprised to see tanks running around uh, the Battle of Stalingrad going, what the hell is this? And the humans adapt fast, and the aliens just don't know what to deal with. What's well, that adaptability, right? That it is, even when humans are still clearly outmatched in alien invasion stories it's sometimes our ability to adjust on the fly and find some critical little thing we can exploit i mean i was thinking as we were talking of a more modern thing which would be like independence day where they mm -hmm. don't defeat the aliens with superior technology they use their wit to develop a computer virus that just makes them vulnerable and then exploit the vulnerability Obviously, later Independence Day actually makes the argument that humans have, like, reverse engineered their technology, which is a different thing. But that different? idea yeah, that, like, humans can overcome anything, uh, usually dystopias are reserved for when humans do things to ourselves. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> less so the aliens have invaded, as it were. The right, yeah. That, um, I was thinking about that in reference to the title, The Demon Breed. Um, one might think at the beginning of the book that the demon re breed refers to the uh, the uh, alien invaders, which are... Um, Demon-like-ish? Uh, they're yeah. described basically like that. Yeah, I mean, we got two subspecies of, of aliens. We small the small intelligent ones and the big brutes. So yeah, you mm -hmm. think, oh yeah, they're demons, obviously. Right, early when uh, Dr. Etland is uh, exploring Tikos's lab uh, that they took him from, uh, she uh, sees what she thinks is a sort of doll on a shelf. Quote, it was as if a small demonic idol had been set up to preside over what had become of Tikos Kays' laboratory. So you think, oh, the demons must be the aliens. But reading through the whole book... Uh, Turning, you know, given the 
utter panic that gets induced in the invaders. Um, uh, I kind of tend to think that the real demon breed is humanity. Um, let's see, there's a quote from... Well, it's worth noting that the book sets you up for this, because like, I, I just double-checked that I wasn't hallucinating it, but it's like halfway between, uh, on, on page two of the book, that he the text literally refers to them as the demons. <laughs> like, mm. So so we're the book is very much pulling a bit of a switcheroo in that respect, is what the argument we're really making. <laughs> right. Right. So I was gonna just read a short quote. Uh, the sure, Federation sure. is a biological fortress armed by the nature of its species. The forces fortress may be easily penetrated. When this occurs, it turns into a complex of unpredictable but always deadly traps. So, you know, that's all very feel-good and humanity will prevail. And that was in the wind, in the air of a lot of science fiction of of, uh, of the time. And I suppose a lot of uh, science fiction of now, too. <laughs> it's, you know, that, that hasn't exactly gone away. Um, but... Uh, it's it's uh, certainly an optimistic book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, it is an optimistic book. I mean, we go out, we we colonize large parts of the galaxy. We've got planets. We got all sorts of planets. Uh, we have a loose government. People are people are moving and doing things. And I mean, it's it's obviously stable enough that uh, Doctor K can just like say, "I'm going to go to this. I'm going to go to this far ocean planet on the edge of known space to try to." research immortality because that's what I want to do and that's just a normal thing. Yeah. Did you... It's just it's just interesting world building in this how this world is set up. I mean I mean the, mm -hmm. the name is plan is Nandy Stack Klein. Who's Nandy and Klein? We don't know, but you know, it's like it's it's it's, it's is it like, like this universe's version of Bonnie and Clyde? I don't know. <laughs> Could it be for all we know. Did they steal this planet? I don't know. Um but you know it na names have names have power. Um, I mean, not not Nile, Nile and Tico's aren't common names now, so that's so Schmitz is obviously having fun with the evolution of proper names and first names and mm -hmm. all sorts of things. There's a lot of in weird stuff going on in the way that he builds the world. Uh, not and just... the randomly uplifted otters. Well, they're not so random. Question well... mark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the way the book explains the presence of the intelligent otters on the planet is that uh, someone had sent away for intelli for like dog level intelligence trainable domesticated otters and when the shipment arrived uh, after he had been training them for a while they started talking back to him and you know now decades later uh Bunches of them have, it's not quite clear whether they escaped or were let go or just didn't come back, but there, there's now a population of wild otters who still speak uh, transling, the uh, common tongue. Um, and, uh, uh, but some stay with humans because humans tend to do interesting stuff, more interesting than just catching fish and stuff. Um, but uh, it's, uh, I, I like the random feel of, you know, they, they have, people have tried to find out, to trace back, you know, where this came from. Uh, but the web of commerce is so vast and complex in, in uh, the Federation with its thousands of human planets mm -hmm. that, you know, you know, it's just, you know. There's no they can't where figure they it out. From. They can't yeah. figure out how it happened, how the accident happened, but here they are. Well, and interestingly, with that the thing with the otters that I is, was is, is interesting is like as they describe what they guess is some sort of genetic mishap, right? That that maybe this wasn't the intended final result. This is what we got, but they mm -hmm. describe that they now have a new natural order that they operate under because the, once they become essentially adults is when they typically will leave to go to the wild. And there are like, you know, roving groups of them in, in the ocean that supposedly have been seen that like hang out and still talk. 
uh, which right. suggests that they're now evolving and developing potentially their own a whole culture, yeah. civilization, which is exciting. Right. Uh, yeah, they're but, developing uh, their own weapons. Even they they uh, figure out how to make poison dart blowpipes, um, and uh, you know that's pretty cool for. <laughs> That's awesome it, it, and terrifying. Or could have just been an exploited species, but yeah. it, remi- it reminds me of a of a science fiction role playing game, which is in the process of being reissued in a new edition called Blue Planet. Are you familiar with Blue Planet, Sean? Nope. Paul, I okay. was born Blue- in 1983. <laughs> you say that a lot to me. Oh. Anyway, Blue Planet. What Blue Planet was an RPG. Basically, the premise is about a hundred years from now, we find a stargate in our solar system that goes to another solar system, a solar system with a water world planet. So with, 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 uh, with no intelligent life, but plenty of other life. So we go through, we colonize it. Earth has a civil war and communications cut off for a hundred years. So the survivors on the planet do their best. And then finally earth comes back. It's like, Hey, we're here. And the, the, the natives, which are humans, Whales and dolphins are the, the locals that have been there for 100 years are kind of skeptical of these new human corporate people coming through and trying to mess up their planet. So there's all sorts of conflicts between the, the new arrivals, the people who have been there for 100 years, and there are apparently, I don't want to spoil it, there are aliens. But nobody knows that yet. So... <laughs> It, so when I was thinking of the otters, I thought I could drop these otters on the blue planet; it would just work just fine. I might do that if I run Blue Planet as an RPG because these otters are awesome, and they would fit Blue Planet just perfectly as another as another intelligent species among everything else that goes on on that planet. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Blue Planet's a very fun world. I'll have I mean, to when, check you, it out. When, when you when you have dolphins. In, in in basically in kind of like Waldo suits being able to shoot torpedoes at enemy ships, you know, that's kinda of awesome. Don't piss don't piss off the dolphins. Especially when they have uh <laughs> torpedoes at their command. Okay. Okay. Well, talking of, of comps, uh this book also reminded me a lot of uh David Bren's Uplift War mm-hmm. series. Um, which uh some of that involves uh uh uh, well, I think the first one called the Uplift War uh, is mainly water based, um, and uh, uh, humans have have uh, done genetic engineering on dolphins and chimpanzees and some other species to uh, uplift their intelligence, and they've joined a galactic federation, and then things happen with conflicts, but. Uh, uh, the diverse biologies and ecologies that uh, people deal with in some of those books um, uh, are are have a lot of fun ideas uh, and very complex worlds. Um, uh, humanity is far more on the back foot uh, in in those books than it is here. Yeah, they're they're the, they're the junior kids on the block. The other the other aliens of uh, that galaxy don't quite know anything to know to do with humans because every other species they can figure out okay we were progenitated by this species and that species progenitated them all the way around and humans are like sitting out there like no nobody progenitated us and the aliens are going like bull crap somebody must have created you <laughs> who created you show us your creators yeah. yes look you even created ones of your own you created these dolphins and chimpanzees so who created you so that's a whole plot through the entire series. Who created humanity? And if they didn't, then what does that mean? We evolved. <laughs> but that doesn't happen, Sean. Didn't you the, see? The aliens... No, no, no. You saw 2001 Space Odyssey when uh, the, the like, cosmic baby returns to Earth? Yes. It's an endless cycle. But, but, it's but, an but, infinite but, regress. But, but, the, the, we create the, ourselves. I mean, we, we were uplifted by the monolith in 2001. But we put it there because the space baby put it there. That, that that's a stable time loop. That's what we call a stable time. <laughs> we create time loop, ourselves, John. Paul. We create ourselves in an endless cycle for all time. That's the only purpose to mankind. <laughs> oh, oh, oh dear, 
Well, <laughs> that's debatable. <laughs> yeah. uh, wow, oh, this on, one deep. Speaking of weird things, so the aliens uh, mm-hmm. have the bat- a really yeah yeah they they have a rather curious culture uh, that has hierarchical and mm-hmm. clean up promotions. They have promotions that usually clean up promotions. Yes, in death. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, and they have factions, but those factions operate on what, what seems like a kind of groupthink, where it, they operate under you're you're part of the voice of X, right? The voice of action, or what have you. And uh, depending on the circumstances that occur, one of those voices may gain more power than another, and one may not be able to challenge that voice in your in the political structure uh, of the Think Great Palash. Palash. Palak? Palak, no, I've been Palak. saying. Palak, okay. Yeah, who knows. Um, the uh, the species is Parahuan. I have no idea how it's actually pronounced, but like Para and H-U-A-N. But uh, then there are the lesser Palaks and the great Palaks then with the hierarchy you were talking about. But yeah, this is one of the things that I, I like about this book is that the aliens are not monolithic. They have factionalism uh, between them, as you said, the voice of caution and the voice of action. And uh, that is a huge reason, huge uh, wedge that uh, Dr. Etland is able to exploit in her psychological warfare that she conducts against the uh the invaders um and it's it's fun that you know you you wonder how long has has is is it, are these the two factions that have done this you know been the major factions in the species for all time uh you know or it, do they it, rise it, and fall yeah yeah it gives depth to this species even though you know none of them are particularly sympathetic uh none of the uh characters the alien characters that we meet but it gives depth to them nonetheless even though you know we don't have to like them but we can see there's some interesting stuff going on with their history yeah i mean this the story leaves a lot of that kind of to be discovered it it but it by framing these two cultures against each other you you're sort of tasked with trying to un- unpack what makes them similar, but also quite different because I feel like, well, this is a thing that has existed in the U S the way it is presented, not the U S excuse me, in human cultures, I should say the way this is presented is intended to make us look at what makes it very similar to cultures we've seen where there's factionalism and uh, people operate under representative voices, etc., cetera, uh, perhaps voluntarily or otherwise. Um, we maybe don't do a lot of the killing our opposition as much these days. Um, <laughs> some people might be sad about that. I'm generally opposed to the murder. But, yeah, but still, but but the thing that it, I feel like it does that a lot of science fiction does is it it takes that out of the language that we would associate with all these different categories and then makes them just pulls them back a little bit so that the language they use seems more alien. It isn't really. Because you can kind of break it down and go, there's obviously some analogs to the real world, but it kind of still makes us go, but this political structure is a little bit screwed up. <laughs> it's, I mean, your if your promotion involves, well, you're you got two options: you kill or you be killed, and that's how you get you you either get a promotion and live, or you 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 kill someone or you die. Like that's it. Like that is a very regressive system that is almost reductively. In, like a reductive interpretation of like survival of the fittest. That's oh, essentially, and, 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 yeah. but but they, but they but they clearly, as they say in the book, they they clearly are in in the in the little D sense of the word, they are Darwinist. They believe in survival of the fittest. They believe they're the most fit species, so they should be able to kick over the, these these uh, these these uplifted apes and just do what they want because they're the dominant species. And and uh, so, of course, when when Niall starts opposing them, of course. And uh, Tico throws throws the throws the bait down. Of course, they go for the idea. Oh, there must be some higher faction of humanity because that's just logical. It could be the, these regular humans b- defeating us. No way. No, it's, it's just it, it, they just can't understand. They can't comprehend it. it. The only way they can understand it in their own mindset is if yeah, there's a superior faction of humanity doing all this stuff because that's that's the way their culture has 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 organized their their worldview. 
Well, you can obviously see the immediate analogs and cultures that have existed, not necessarily in the panelists' lifetime, uh, but 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 not terribly far outside of of our of our lifetimes, where people mm-hmm. are exposed to. I mean, these are human cultures, right? But they're exposed to human cultures that can do things that they claim can't be done. Uh, I'm thinking here, maybe not as a direct analog, but the kind of very famous discussion of Hitler, which is the the moment when black athletes go to the Olympics on the side of the Americans and just stomp all over. Uh, and it kind of defeats that, that like uh, uh, racial superiority argument kind of throws it out, out, out with the water. Like you, you can't really make this argument if you've been so roundly defeated in this very, obviously very narrow and specific context, but still, and these aliens are running into that on a species level now, which is humans, we should be able to defeat them. We're better than them in every way, but yet they keep being able to get out of these things. I mean, even the beginning of this book, and then as we go through, Tycho is essentially manipulating them, trying to get away with things. He kind of gets caught at points, but he he's still holding back information from these beings that otherwise should figure it out except that they they don't uh, really they kind of figure out parts of it but they never really get the full picture and it, it turns out that humans are good at lying so <laughs> <laughs> it's one of our best traits apparently <laughs> we can <laughs> lie through our teeth i don't know if that's a virtue i just want to be clear i'm not <laughs> sure <laughs> that's it's the skill species. set we it, wanted it's, a, it's- it's a spe- it's a species trait we have whether it's good or bad. Yeah, that's very but, interesting. Yeah. But but that weird alien politics and humans exploiting them makes me think of don't ground and makes me think of a Jerry Pornell and Larry Niven novel that would be Footfall, where where where, where, oh, the, where the where the Fathips show up and at some points um, humans get captured and put on their ship and. The humans start manipulating the factions on the spaceship immediately. Like we, we're not going to show how good we are at stuff. We're going to do stuff once, once, and not for others, and basically gather information. So, yeah, showing showing the aliens are not a monolithic block that they can be exploited, and that humans are humans are clever liars again. And yeah, the the, the fifth are have better technology and are bigger and stronger, but hum, humans are cleverer and the. And more deceptive. I mean, there was the scene where where the guy has the the sphere and is like like flips it and throws it throws it in a way that the alien didn't expect and kills it because you know the human adapt adap- adap- adaptability uh, in full force and the aliens just don't know what to do with that. Mm. We should be stop- curb stomped. I mean, they throw <laughs> they throw an ast- they throw an asteroid into the ocean and yet the hu- they and yet the humans just keep on coming. It's very much in the Schmidt's vein. I wonder where this comes from. Like, so much of science fiction has this idea that, like, I mean, you said it very point blank, Paul. Like, humans are clever, and that gets us out of things. And we've mentioned this now multiple times. And I, I don't deny I, that I, humans I, I, are I, clever. I, I, but... I think it's a species thing because we've survived a heck of a lot that this planet has thrown at us. I mean. Yeah, I but mean, that's 70... different than that's very different if it's like nature. That is this like disembodied, non sentient thing that just stuff happens and we manage to survive. It's very different. I don't when know, you're but, 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 this also, but 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 there's also uh, I mean there's I mean there's also stories from human history of nations resisting greater powers and punching way above their weight. I mean, I right. mean, well, American I, I, history, uh, yeah. Uh, what are these people doing? They're not lining up in lines against our lines of soldiers. They're shooting from, you know, cover and stuff. That's not They're fair. having the kids throw <laughs> rocks at us. What the <laughs> hell is that all about? That the Charlotte Hornets got named because because uh, the, 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 the British generals say, well, I'm being attacked by Hornets because all, all the populace is just stoning us. It's like, what the hell? So uh, in chat, Rainbow Warrior is mentioning that Campbell demanded human exceptionalism. So perhaps uh, there's yeah, some well, aspect that, of that might be here. help help ba- ba- <laughs> baking into uh baking into 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 science. I mean, I mean, Heinlein certainly was all big about specializations for insects and humans are 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 
are the one best species. I mean, Lazarus <laughs> Long and his and his and his brood defeat gods and things on their on their adventures. So, yeah, it, it's it just seems so curious to me because I kind of lost. I, I had a thing I was gonna say, and now now it left my brain. But I was I was trying to get at this idea that, um, you know, so many of our stories are are about humans being rather exceptional at being Be, clever. And, and, but and yet, yet being the underdog. The underdog. But, yeah, and yet being clever, often, and yet being, <laughs> yeah, the underdog, underdog yeah. and super clever. Although uh, a, a configuration queen mentions in chat that uh, one of their favorite bits from Jurassic Park is when the hunter guy says clever girl admiring the, the raptors sneaking <laughs> The velociraptors, yes. And that is a great moment in that movie because... It's mm-hmm. the hunter realizing he's been out hunted by a hunter. Yeah, who, yeah. Who has... That is a that's as a perfect reversal of this trope. Like, no, for once the hunter is out clevered by yeah. the velociraptor. And, Oops. And I, oddly enough, while it is an 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 agent that is involved in saving the humans at the end, it's the agent is not doing it because it wants to save them. The agent just is the T Rex shows up to, right. to stop the velociraptors. It's almost like. When Godzilla a force of nature. appears as like a force of nature, mm-hmm. yeah, 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 force of nature. So, yeah, it's, it's like a right. kaiju. You can't fight it. It just, it's, it's, it's just it's a, there. <laughs> it's just there. Yeah. It's 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 an area effect. Yeah, and like in this <laughs> yeah. in this book, right? This this book is so much about this conflict between two peoples, two completely different species that have drastically different cultures and expectations within those cultures, uh, and the conflict that that produces is one of you know, it's really about superiority, uh, which, you know, you would associate with invasion and war, but it is to some degree more than physical. It's it's mental superiority. It's it is kind of a battle about who is the most clever, right? The one capable of mentally adapting to whatever the other throws at it. And, and naturally, that's a very messy, a messy thing, right? When we think of like alien invasions, the aliens usually win by might in the in the beginning and then they're they're usually taken over because they're too overconfident right they always miss something right whereas in this book it's not necessarily that they always miss things they do uh but it is that in large respects their culture has worked for so long in this capacity that once they've met somebody who isn't e- easily mowed over by that method of managing a culture right they don't have they have no adaptation to it they don't what are they supposed to adapt to they've not had to do this before whereas perhaps the argument is that humans even though no agents necessarily throughout our history in all circumstances we've had to constantly figure out how to how to make it through tough things over and over and that's our default mode yeah, actually, I'm I'm suddenly thinking of a book called The Infinity Concerto. I can't think of the name of the author. Huh? Greg Bear? Maybe. Is it, you... uh, is no, that I think it? I think you're thinking it's... Richard Wagner. <laughs> no. Yeah, very very different tone. Um. Anyway, this is a, a fantasy book where um uh humans and elves are coming into conflict after being separated for a long time and uh the protagonist who is who starts out as a teenage boy um uh eventually realizes that uh elves ha- sorry that humans have a huge advantage in that they are flexible and elves are not partly because elves are very long lived and humans are mayflies um and so not not being as long lived as the elves they aren't as bound by culture and tradition um and can innovate better um i'll mute myself and look up who that is but uh yeah, it is great it is great it is great yeah, yeah, it is great yeah, configuration okay. queen has right. got it for us in chat right thank you um so so yeah so you know this is uh not just science fiction but also fantasy, fantasy that too. uh yeah. <laughs> hey hey humans are great <laughs> you know that's just uh optimism yeah, there's no no reason at all to think that whatever cultures whatever other species we might run up against might not be infinitely more capable whether they were you know 
childhood and just, you know, super technologically advanced or just ac actually, you know, genetically uh, superior in, in whatever ways. We don't know. I'm, 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 I'm th now I'm thinking of Gordon Dixon's Way of the Pilgrim series. Actually, series of stories they've turned into a novel where aliens have conquered the Earth and our main character basically is kind of a um, agent for one of them and basically go and he tries to organize. I'm going to spoil this book. Sorry. Sorry. We're in spoiler land anyway. He tries to organize humanity against the aliens secretly. And this turns out to be a terrible idea because the aliens are just outclasses. He basically, in the end, makes our makes Earth and humans distasteful and not worth it for the aliens to keep conquering. So they decide to <laughs> leave. Not not because we beat them in the field or anything. It's just, it's just, it's just like, like, yeah, you basically the aliens say, no, you're the aliens explain, oh, we got we got this place of our own world and now we've gone to other worlds and colonized yours, but we've got we're gonna go back at our enemy and and the main character says, Great, we could uh, uh, us us humans can help you with that. We can go fight this enemy of yours now that now that you're not going to conquer us. And the aliens just say, "No, you're not worthy. Goodbye." And leave. <laughs> it's like so they never actually are beaten. They 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 the aliens just like are sick of sick sick of our bullshit and just decide to leave Earth for another for other other places. Yeah. Well, speaking of that offer, though, there are quite a few series in the last couple of decades where um, humans have been tapped to be. The grunts, the grunt warriors in uh, mm -hmm. other species. There's a lot conflicts. of pain books with this theory, with with this theme. Yeah, like <laughs> yeah, we're, we're we're the warriors for the galaxy. Or right. Look at the role of humans in Tobias Bickel's Xenowulf saga. There you go. Because at the very beginning of that book, some of the humans have basically been enslaved and turned into pets for aliens. Mm-hmm. So, right, I mean, or Jim idea... Hines's, uh, what, the, what are they called? The space janitor? janitor? Yeah, that's Skin space, Figuration Queen. The Beach space janitor it. stories, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah, Thank the, you the humans, well, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil the series. The first book has a revelation that is relevant to this discussion, but I don't want to spoil it for people because yeah, it's we, a really yeah. fun book. But it anyway, you know. Interesting. Though, yeah. if you took uh, all this and you looked at these general plots and which ones view humans very optimistically as always being able to handle the thing, mm -hmm. and if that has changed in the present, because I would argue we're in a little bit more of a pessimistic time at the moment, <laughs> I mm -hmm. would say, and I wonder if that if leads into the fiction. That is like a, a massive study, though. Someone needs to start yeah, that, 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 that's a That's a doctoral <laughs> candidate's... <laughs> Science yeah, I remember thesis. a panel at a Worldcon hmm, some years ago. Maybe it maybe it was in Texas, Lone Star Con. Anyway, um, uh, someone on a panel was complaining about how much more pessimistic science fiction had gotten, and a different panelist said, "Well, I think I I may have part of a handle on that." And he asked the audience, "How many of you?" Uh, own or expect to to own a home in your lifetime, and only about a quarter of the people's hands went up, and that's just an absolutely huge change from fifty years ago or whatever. It's uh you know there's uh, <laughs> uh a lot of economic uh uh a lot less economic optimism these days among uh. It's hard to, yeah, I yeah, get it. Yeah, it's hard to be an optimist these days. Yeah. Well, okay, so I want to I take a second at the book just a little bit, because we only briefly really talked about it, and and I want to make sure that we talk about it before we have to end this. Um, I know that we said at the very beginning, we were like, oh, this book, like, uh, Wikipedia says it's like the, one of the earliest uh, feminist science fiction books, and we all went and rolled our eyes no, and said, no, no, it's no, no, no. But... <laughs> I, in that same conversation about the sort of background around the book, we talked about the fact that one of the main characters is a woman who is the, the, the enormously, main character is a woman. yeah, yeah, is enormously competent. Uh, she, I mean, it it really stuck out to me. You know, we're only really kind of told she's competent when when we get that like background scene of her with Tycho, right? Where 
Like, she went to school. She knows what she's doing. She's clearly in a position of some degree of authority. Like, those kinds of things. But yeah, it's I mean, mostly kind she of... She sets him on the island, all the stuff, yeah. Yeah, but it's mostly kind of just, like, kind of told to us. The kinds of actions she's doing it doesn't give us the full breadth. It's when she first goes to the island and the the, the quote-unquote Bar- Parahuians uh, essentially sh- try to, like, turn off her ship and make it so she has to fly down you see just how good she is at everything she does she's pulling all these flaps and she's using them to make sure that she's deceptive in the way that she goes down because she knows she's been attacked and there's a sense to which she is very much in control at all times about anything that she's involved in she knows exactly what to do and while obviously other books in this period do have competent women uh it really stuck out to me just how much energy this book puts into making her seem uh, not just seem, make her actually competent. She knows what she's doing compared to other works where she might be relegated to like, you know, a, a sexy side lady or uh, yeah, yeah. maybe she's competent, but just because she has doctor in front of her name, <laughs> not because she's actually doing anything. We've seen movies for torture cinema that do. She's just she's it says doctor in front. So that right. She's a strong woman. It's like, but <laughs> but she's being hounded over by like five guys in this house like so yeah so I, i'm curious about you guys what you you took from kind of the trajectory for now uh that that's such, which is such an interesting character well it's ridiculous to say that she's the first feminist uh uh character in science fiction i i'm boggled that anyone could come up with that uh but it is true that in this era uh female protagonists uh especially female protagonists without love interests were very rare in the genre um and uh as far as this book is concerned she doesn't have a romantic partner she's not looking for a romantic partner she is totally focused on her career and then on the invasion um but uh you know although it does turn out later that there's a guy she works with. Um, it's not clear whether he's her superior or a colleague or what. And anyway, there's no shadow of romantic whatever between them. She's just a woman doing her job and doing it very well. And it's very gratifying <laughs> to, uh, to, to read that and, you know, not have the, a woman who is an adjunct uh, of some guy in the plot. You know, she's, she, uh, uh she she works with some guys <laughs> she works with Dico's k but she's she is very absolutely her own person um and yeah i cannot think of uh, hardly any books um uh in 1968 um you you were starting to have some stuff certainly uh uh ursula Le Guin had some uh some female and non-binary characters uh but um uh you know this is I, this is uh really a standout book for that era for a female character yeah i i when when i when i um consumed this book i was half expecting nile to fall for Tico's K or vice versa, but nope, they just have a professional relationship and Nile's not interested in that. Nile just wants to kick the aliens off the planet. Thank you very much. Um, no no time for kissy face. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Jones, to, to quote the movie. He's like, kissy face. That's adorable. <laughs> <laughs> but no, so, 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 go ahead, uh, well, it, it dawned on me that uh, she does have the otters. And your inclination might be to think that, oh, they're like surrogate children, except even in her narration, right? Schmitz basically says she doesn't know why they're still there because they're adults. They don't they normally would leave. So maybe they just view yep. her as a curiosity. No, <laughs> no, they, 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 they enjoy working with her because they're, they're curious. They're interested. They warn her about the yeah. aliens. They're eager to participate in dealing with the aliens. They're vicious little buggers too. It's like, Oh yeah. They're, they're, they're yeah. not to be messed with. I mean, <laughs> you you yeah. mentioned the poison arrows and stuff. Yeah. They're, they're willing, they're willing to get their hands dirty to, to fight off the alien menace. And they work very well with Nile um, in that regard. So, I think yeah, that's so. the key is, is it isn't a, a true familial relationship. It is to some degree a working relationship. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
so yeah, so 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 she she's a standout character in that regard. I mean, this is 1968, and she's not the first feminist character, but she's cer- she certainly she's certainly on an early on, this book is an early wave of char- of strong female characters that don't need a man, don't go falling for a man at the first chance they get, and they can handle themselves and handle the plot. And I mean, Tico's is is. Is 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 basically the appendage to her, not the other way around. Right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, he's gone for most of the book. I mean, it's, it's the not it's the Niles and Otters show to fight the Parahuans, and Tikos is off screen for most of the book, even well, though he's she, there at the beginning. She earns, uh, you know, not necessarily all all throughout the book. She earns, but she has earned this skill set. Right. This this can be uh-huh. like yeah. the, the, the it, book is she, immediate she answer born, to like she, the Mary Sue statement because someone might say, oh, she's just so confident. So you must be a Mary Sue. And it's like, no, like she went to college, like she studied her ass off to get to where she is. And, she's and, been and working she lived on this hard off. planet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so right. she has practical and and uh, and um, intellectual skills and she blends those. And that's it's, it's like she's not just the the intellectual uh a pie in the sky. She knows how to apply her knowledge and go planting bombs to blow up alien ships. It's like, what's not to love? I mean, that's yeah. true love right there. We all would want a woman who could uh, plant bombs and to stop on alien, alien ships. Yes, it, yeah, yeah. it, 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 it is absolutely <laughs> yep. true. Yep, that is every heterosexual man's dream, <laughs> and also probably every every gay woman's dream. I would imagine too. Yeah, there there is no queerness in this book, readers. It's 1968. It's, yeah, it's not. It's not mentioned. It's not just mentioned at all. Period. Yeah, it's just absent. Which it's just it's just, it's just absent. Which I guess is better than some of the books appeared, which have negative depictions yeah. of queerness. The, I'll the take that just, over just, over yeah. more like treating it like a, a mental illness or something. Right. That's yeah. Around here this it's just, era. Yeah. Yeah. Here it's just it it it. it just doesn't come up at all. I would like to think that it's not a thing. It is a thing, not a problem in Schmitz's verse because this is a very, as as Trisha, as Trisha said, a very laissez-faire universe. The government doesn't really get involved in about getting involved with the government to do anything in this universe is hard. So I would like to think it's that queerness is okay, but we just don't have any evidence of 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 it existing. Well, Sorry, without without some listening. sort of sense of the actual authors politics and they're in an interview with them about potentially this world the best we can say is uh it, it it is just like it's an absence of course you can read that rather negatively to say that homosexuality doesn't exist anymore because what's what is the likely outcome of of something not be supporting in a culture but i don't know that that's entirely fair either it could just be the author's just that's just a, a black hole in their mind that's not a thing they're thinking about or you can do world building and you can't get ev- all the pieces so perhaps this is a book where they were you know schmitz was interested in a b and c and really not a lot outside of that which i think mm-hmm. is probably more of an accurate you know i don't think it's intending to erase things to be there doesn't seem to be a deliberateness to it it seems like that that schmitz is in, interested in some very specific world building and cultural elements and plot points and that's what's really on display but yeah i can't think of any instances of uh schmidt stories where he is offensive to um uh bipoc or uh lgbtq plus uh he doesn't he just doesn't address it as far as i can remember it wouldn't um, be that uncommon for the era. No, no. Yeah. But, you know, at least, uh, you know, you're not going to get an unexpected punch in the face if you read one of these books. Yeah, yeah, that would yeah. be... Not that I can think of. Yeah, I can't... Uh, well, I'm not familiar with all this work, so I will take your word for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a thing that certainly in this series, right, we would probably be deliberately trying to avoid that the punches in the face which we can uh, those examples we know oh we yeah know absolutely yeah we may have to we may feel we need to discuss some books that have very problematic stuff in them but uh i certainly don't want to go looking for <laughs> right. <laughs> right it's, it's a little emphasize different stereotypes yeah. and things 
Yeah, it's a little different to sort of like we're picking this book and we know it's just full of controversial thing after controversial thing versus we no, read a book. I want this and it to be a fun element. series. Yeah, yeah this is yeah, yeah. Yeah, this we're is mining for gold, series. not for muck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're mining for we're, mi- we're mining for latinum here, not for latinum. Crap. There you go. No, no, oh no, not no, no. Yeah. keep the Frankie away. You keep them away. <laughs> I can't take They're it. Com- are you the Grand Nagus, Paul? Is that who you are? <laughs> I don't have the ears for it. Or the lobes. Sorry. <laughs> Besides, the Grand Nagus knows the difference between Tibet and Nepal. <laughs> oh, man. The... That guy's never going to live this down, Paul. One day you're going to be at a no, convention he that he's not, at, and you'll be wearing the he. shirt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay, do we have any last thoughts before we close out? Any last quick things you'd want to bring up? Um, yeah, we had promised that we were going to announce our next book, but we haven't picked one yet. We haven't Sorry, picked one yet. that's Listen. just going to have, you're going to have to watch the social medias for that one. Okay. We'll, war- we'll warn you as soon as... A- Unless we want to do it right one. now, but <laughs> that might well, take on. a while. Here's oh, what I'm going to ask. We we obviously are going to do the whole closeout and stuff, so that's plenty of time for folks to do this. Why don't we take suggestions in chat? Oh, Sure. And we can then we'll we can use those. It'll make it easier for us to pick a book. So how about yeah. chat? Everybody in chat, just toss out one, maybe two lesser known works from pre nineteen eighty. That's the year we've taken for these. Yeah, nineteen eighty is uh, yeah is is our horizon. Yeah, yeah. Before so, Sean was so born. we we are not going to be studying Hugo and Nebula winners because there are other thing other venues you can find out all about that stuff. What we're looking for is hidden gems, overlooked gems, erased gems uh, that you feel, you know, that you think will enjoy reading <laughs> and yeah, hearing we, we us have, talk we, about. We, we want fun and the book's interesting to talk about. Mm-hmm. That's what we want. So we'll start. Oh, that's the, a good the, one. Configuration queen. Yeah, we will start the I'm not process sure when it was. of uh, Nova. Nova doesn't count space age. That that's uh, that. No, Delaney. <laughs> Delaney is not overlooked. Sorry. It's a good I idea. I love but Delaney. Not don't get me wrong. I know if I could sneak a Delaney in, I would. But I feel like if we did Nova. Uh, that would that that's already a gem. That is a that is a diamond. Yeah, that, that, that's that's kind of known. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's I mean, a great I, book. I mean, though. I, I mean, really did, like did any of you know about uh, the Demon Breed before coming to this podcast? Probably not. Nova, I think you probably do. Yeah. So I guess to think about like picking books that you love but like nobody else ever talks about. That is from. I mean, like I put, like like, yeah. like I pick in my column. It's like it's like the, 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 that those kind of books is like. Yeah, CQ great, great asks stuff out there. if the author has to be overlooked or just the book. I kind of feel like the author. I don't really feel a strong need to discuss Heinlein or Asimov uh, oh, on this podcast. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. those those are all going to be well enough known. If you know, if it's an obscure book by a reason by a mid level author, then certainly we'd think about that. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess what we're getting away from is we don't really want award winners, uh, books that like, you know, everybody like Slaughterhouse Five. Too, no, that's that's too big. Um, <laughs> getting away from stuff that's maybe not like books by really big names, because I think that would be a bit, like, yeah, like Niven is being mentioned in chat, um, by Space Age Mermaid. You know, Niven's written some books that certainly nobody talks about anymore because he's written so many damn books. But it's also Larry Niven. <laughs> so if we say Larry Niven, like everybody knows who that is. So maybe moving a little bit away from the big names to to something, you know, maybe someone who's lesser known but has a a you know not a very popular book. I don't know. There's there's a lot of options there. But yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of works out there. Yeah, mm-hmm. creative. So this is a note I to mean, folks at home. Suggest are, anything oh, you want, but. We're probably yeah. not going to look at the, be- the 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 authors who don't need our help. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't yeah, self reject. Yeah. Make suggestions. Don't self reject. Self yeah, so for I mean, folks at home, keep in mind you can also make suggestions. We're just obviously doing these recordings live, so the chat and our mm-hmm. live show is putting a whole bunch of stuff in there. So, so anyway, okay. Skiffy, so if Skiffy and everybody keep doing that while we while we do the slow transition out of uh, the show. Stanislav Lim. Um. Uh. 
I would say science fiction experts, you know, genre historians certainly know Stanislav Lim, but a lot of people don't. So I think we could consider Stanislav here, Lim. Here, 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 here's a, whatchamacallit, here's a spoiler for, for listeners. I do have a minor Stanislav Lem column coming coming to the blog soon on a minor Stanislav Lem novel you probably haven't read. No, it's not Solaris. It's something else. Okay. Stay tuned. Okay. So anyway, in chat, throw up some some other names in it of what you think, and then we're gonna start our closing out of this show monstrosity. Uh, right. And so, <laughs> if you're listening to the podcast later, we'll talk soon about ways you can reach us. That's perfect. Okay. So, uh, we just proceed right to close out. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I think- I think we nailed it. Okay. So for folks at home, if you'd like to let us know your thoughts about this novel or any other episode, etc., there's a bunch of places you can go for this. Um, the best place to go is skiffingfanny.com slash listener suggestions, or you can email us, which is just skiffingfanny at gmail. The Skiffing Fanny Show is on Blue Sky, Threads, Instagram, TikTok, and a whole bunch of other places. We have what's called a link tree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E, slash Skiffy and Fanty. That'll take you to all of our socials uh, and other things. Our Patreon is also there, and patreon.com slash Fanny is that. If you'd like to give us a dollar, that'd be lovely. And please, if you're at home and you like this show, go to Apple Podcasts or wherever you do your podcasts, and please leave us a, a review so folks know that we're there. Paul is miming about a, a coin he's holding. Yeah, I got, I got a coin. It's like, give us money. <laughs> oh, oh, got it. I I was very confused why you were holding up a coin of your own face. Because you were talking about the Patreon, so I'm holding up my coin. Like, I know, but we coin, don't accept we don't accept ancient Roman currency, Paul. <laughs> I accept it because I'm an ancient I'd Roman. Accept it. <laughs> uh, anyway, for me, uh, I'm at SeanDuke.net. Obviously, I'm here at Alphabet Streams, where Skiffy and Fanny also is. Uh, my streams are Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays at 7 p.m. Central. I have a Patreon, which is slash Joy Factory, and I'm also on Blue Sky Threads and all the places. And that is, a, again, a link tree slash Sean Duke. And that's where you can find me. You are eligible to find me across the internet as Prince Justin. I do book reviews. I do podcasting. I do streaming with Sean. I share photos. I have a Patreon, patreon.com slash Prince Justin. Um, you throw a rock, you can find me and... Apparently these days I'm talking to the Guardian and NBC News and things. So, you know, <laughs> you can find me. And you can find me, Trishy M, on Blue Sky at P.E. Matson on Mats- Mastodon, uh, newsy.social slash at Trish E. M. On my blog at what's the words now dot blogspot dot com, where I recently po- published a, uh, a very topical <laughs> genre poem. Um, genre re- rela- fandom related <laughs> poem, yes. Um, and I also write reviews for Skiffy and Fanty on the blog. That's perfect. Oh my lord, it's a it's a wild world. So uh great folks. <laughs> wild wild life shot. That the talking <laughs> head song is going through my brain today. <laughs> it just continues to be wild. So, uh, since uh, it is required in the Skiffy Fanny bylaws that even for the genre, uh, uh, mining the the genre 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 asteroid and stuff, yeah, I got to make it awkward. So, to make it awkward, I will just note that I will be uplifting snakes. (laughs) That is happening. I'm not surprised. That's exciting. Uh, (laughs) Wait, 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 isn't that the UNT from Dungeons and Dragons? Aren't they uplifted snakes? Maybe, but mine will be different, Paul, because I'm going to <laughs> uplift them and then train them to be social creatures. And then I'm going to take over the planet as the Snake King. Wow. Wow. This world will be Abdul, mine. Sean. <laughs> Stay frosty, Sean. Stay frosty. <laughs> uh, take care of yourselves and each other if you can. And on that note, awkward end and scene. Good night, listeners. Good night. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.